moderator of this panel. Um, as a former Woodlawn Tap bartender, this session, <laughs> this session will be held under moderated uh, Jimmy's rules. So that means no beer in the audience. Thank you. Um, beyond that, I do want to thank the college, John Boyer, for the invitation to be here today and to participate in this Taking the Next Steps program. I think this is a terrific program, and uh, I mean that sincerely. I only wish it had existed way back when, um, when it was still below zero in January, whatever year. Um, but, this, uh, but today I think um, we want to look at the future, um, and I think the students at the University of Chicago at the college should be confident. Uh, a University of Chicago degree is a great door opener. Um, from my own experience, um, I can say that I've never, never lost an interview because of it. I've never gotten the job because of it always, but I've always gotten the interview. And I think you should be confident when you look ahead that that's a very strong uh, card uh, in your deck as you go ahead. Um, so after that, of course, it's all up to you. And that, I think, is a great part of this education is to bring you to that point where you can engage in these kind of discussions and job-related discussions. Um, so today, I think we want to begin with the panel. A uh, brief introduction. I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. And then we'll get to questions from our part. I want to try to minimize our part of the program and maximize your part of the program so that the panelists Please be brief, and let's move it ahead in terms of student participation. Thank you. Okay. Fred? <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, my name is Fred Sow. Uh, I am the Senior Policy Counsel at the Illinois Coalition for Immigrants and Refugee Rights. Uh, senior Policy Counsel means I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> what that basically means is that I run the policy shop there, which involves um, research, um, policy development, um, legislative drafting, uh, advocacy work on, on federal, state, and local level uh, on, on matters of, of concern to immigrant and refugee communities throughout the state. Uh, I graduated from the, from, the, from the college in 1985, um, and I can't believe it's been 30 years. Thank you. Hi, my name's Cliff. I'm a managing director for strategy and operations at Teach for America. You'll notice two things there. One, Teach for America is not international, um, hence the title. And two, I am not listed in your program. Uh, I am a last minute sub for, uh, for another panelist. And I'm here partly because I spent my first eight years after University of Chicago working with Peace Corps in various capacities. I finished my graduate work in 2005, or 2003, sorry, uh, at SSA. And then after that, did a two year stint with Peace Corps as a volunteer in youth development overseas, and then worked for six years on the recruitment side here in the Midwest. So that's my background in international nonprofits. Thanks for having me last minute. Mm -hmm. Well, you have much more nonprofit background, I mean, uh, international background than I do. I'm Kelly Kleiman, and I graduated in 1975, and I can't believe it's been years. Um, I, uh, I went to the law school as well as the college, and after a series of misadventures in the law, uh, became a consultant to charities and philanthropies. I helped them organize themselves better and raise more money. And I gave myself the name NFP Consulting, because it sounds like there's more than one of me. But in fact, <laughs> NFP Consulting, c'est moi. <laughs> I'm Robert Kahn. I'm a uh, class of 79 in BA in economics. And right now, I'm a senior fellow, which also means old, uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, DC. Uh, and I, one of the great things about that place is it forces you to interact with people who work on things completely different from you. So I'm, an, as the, one of the economists there, work on the interaction of economics and political uh, developments. So issues like sanctions on Russia, sovereign debt restructurings and the like, and try and look for where, places where economics impacts on diplomacy or foreign policy. Thank you. And again, my name is Jim Pristop. I'm a senior fellow at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. Uh, this is a small think tank that was set up 30 years ago by the Secretary of Defense at that time, Frank Carlucci, 
to serve as a long-term planning staff uh, for the Secretary of Defense and for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We also do work for the State Department, or my former employer. Um, it's very much like the University of Chicago. They ask you impossible questions to which there are no answers, and you come up with the best one you can find. And uh, to me, it's always very challenging. I've enjoyed the work, and uh, so that's what I'm about. Now, we were given a list of questions that hopefully reflect some of the interests of the students, so let me try and go through them very through the panel uh, quickly so that we can get to your real questions and we can address them in that, uh, in that context. I want to minimize the time here for us talking, maximize the time for your questions and answers. So just briefly to the panel, describe for us what the University of Chicago experience was like for you. I think we've all had <laughs> How has it helped you in your industry and your, what were the challenges? What were the best times you had here? <laughs> How did you use the resources at Chicago to help you get to where you are now? So, Fred, do you want to start with that? <laughs> <laughs> I may not be the best person to start this. Um, well, um, my, my career path was actually quite unusual um, in that, um, first off, I began college as a physics major and uh, took 140 level during my first year and quickly washed out of that um, <laughs> and ended up getting a degree in philosophy. Sounds like my uh, school adventure. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I like to joke that, uh, you know, I, I went to law school because what the heck was I going to do with a philosophy degree? But I always, I always had some inkling and interest in, in doing public service work and public interest work, and um, you know that uh, eventually led me to law school. Um, I, you know, interestingly enough, I did not get involved in immigration until fairly well into my post-law career. Um, you know, but uh, you know, I, I, but you know. You know, things happen in life, and uh, and you know, you know, I got interested in immigration, and, that be, and it became a calling for me. So, um, so you know, I, I guess this is a bit of a cautionary tale, or a, you know, uh, you know, in that, you know, I don't think you can really go into. Um, go into college or go past college thinking, well, this is exactly what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. Um, and certainly, I don't think that uh, my career since, uh, since college is what I anticipated doing. Um, as it is, though, you know, let life happen. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I know that I know the phrase, you know, follow your bliss or follow your passion has been, uh, you know, has been thrown about already this today. But um, you know, uh, you know, do you know, do you know, you know, you know, I, you know, I, I pretty much have stayed in the not-for-profit world in my entire career. Um, I knew I wanted to give back in one way or another, and that's what I ended up doing. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, I would say my, you know, with respect to my, you know, my college experience, I think, uh, you know, getting the degree in philosophy, getting, um, you know, get, you know, being able to think about the deeper questions and, you know, take things apart in a really critical way, uh, has helped me both in my law career and and uh, my career, you know, doing doing public policy work, um, and I think that's that was my biggest takeaway from my college experience. Yeah, I did my, my graduate work at SSA, and part of the reason I chose the program, I was coming out of, of social work experience here in Chicago, working at a, a drug rehab program on the north side. Um, and I was really interested in the opportunity to go to a social work program that was interdisciplinary and allowed me to be able to not just be in direct practice social work context, but also learn across a variety of different spaces, including policy, admin, family support. Um, and at the time, my intent was to be in direct practice social work for a while, but I still really had the interest in being in an interdisciplinary program. When I came back from Peace Corps, I took a job in recruitment at Peace Corps, really anticipating that would be a one-year gig, and I would get back to the world of social work. And six years later, I was still at Peace Corps, uh, managing operations and doing recruitment work. And I'm still in the nonprofit administration space, and I think what I'm grateful for from University of Chicago is the fact that I had the opportunity to build a wide enough array of skills during that grad school experience that it really translated well in a number of different directions and it set me up to be able to follow my interests and to be able to change plans and adapt, which I think is something that you'll find you do quite regularly during the course of a career. Um, I'm still figuring out what I want to be when I grow up and so I'm hoping that that grad school experience will continue to translate into a few other contexts from here. But you're not the only one. 
Kelly? Yeah, right. yeah, there's a lot of that going around. And, you know, I don't understand how you guys can all be old and senior and stuff when I'm so youthful. <laughs> I, uh, I went to law school for reasons that uh, now escape me. Um, <laughs> Partly because uh, I wanted to go into politics, and by the time I was ready to go to law school, I knew I didn't want to go into politics, but I couldn't figure out what else to do. Partly because I wanted a credential that would uh, keep people from condescending to me because I was a woman, which was more of a problem then than it is now, although it's still an issue, of course. Um, and my experience in the college at the University of Chicago was such that I found the law school at the University of Chicago pretty easy. And uh, that, I guess, will tell you everything about, you know, the value of rigor in a college education. Um, my career has taken en enough twists and turns that I couldn't possibly have anticipated where it would take me. Um, but at every point, the analytical skills and, and the rigor have, have stood me in good stead. I've also discovered that a variety of ambitions that I had earlier in, in my career, even before I started college, came back to fruition later on. So, you know, as a high school student, I wanted to be a journalist, and 15 years ago, I went back to journalism and felt completely equipped to do that despite lacking a journalism degree because, hey, I went to the University of Chicago. I can do anything. Um, and likewise, about five years ago, I thought, oh, yeah, I remember that I wanted to go into politics. I think I'm going to do that. And so that's, that's my current plan. Um, and that's led me into the world of policy, which I guess is what I'm doing on this panel, although most of what I do involves working directly with small nonprofit agencies, which affect panel, uh, excuse me, which affect uh, policy only indirectly and weakly. But I have always found not only that the U of C credential, but that the U of C training enabled me to do whatever half-ass thing I decided to do next. Fred. I think, you know, a lot of the things you, you're going to hear a lot, and you've heard them already, the sense in which we've all sort of experimented a while before finding our way, and that was okay, and that the skills uh, that we learned here served us really well in our future jobs, and I would second each of both of those. Uh, I also uh, started with a major, then I was sure I was going to be a mathematician, and one term of real analysis, uh, what was the washed out? That was the phrase you used, Fred. Uh, convinced me to, to investigate other ideas. Uh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me in Chicago because I spent the next year and a half kind of trying every different thing and exploring and testing myself and with some success and some not such success, but I felt I had the space here to do that. And then I had an, found an inspirational teacher in economics and thought, this is really interesting stuff. And it helps me solve practical, real-world problems. And I really like that. Uh, so then for the next couple of years, I pretty much took every economics course they would let me take. I had a liberal activist family, so for the, I think there's still a sense in which coming home from school and telling my parents about the evils of rent control, they were sure there was an evil clone that had taken over their son. <laughs> uh, they, they tried to detox me. but but. You know, it wasn't about ideology, it was about thinking about the world and bringing the skills to bear that I learned here. Even though I went on to grad school, I still think probably my Chicago training was the most formative for me. And economics is an interesting space because you can do a lot of different things with it from public policy to more analytic pieces, and in many ways you're using a similar skill set. And I've been fortunate, I've moved back and forth. I've done government a lot, actually the majority of my career sometime in the private sector and now at, at the council to try and step back and think about it and draw thematically. But I think what unifies it is a desire to apply the, school, the, t the skills that I learned starting here to real world problems in some way that hopefully is useful. Yeah. Well, uh, for my part, uh, mm -hmm. describe for us what the University of Chicago experience was like for you. And that's a one word answer. That's challenging. <laughs> uh, never forget showing up in the first quarter and being handed reading lists that would go on forever and said, well, basically, you've got eight weeks to do this plus write three class papers. And wow, that was definitely defined. That was a real challenge. But I think what's looking back on it, it it's, it's the analytical thinking, the way you were forced to deal with issues, to find them in, in your papers, et cetera. 
um, has it just had. It, it's been with me the rest of my life, and it's helped me wherever I've gone, whatever I've done. Uh, and basically, after Chicago, everything else has really been duck soup. Uh, I, I've never felt really challenged in anything else that I've done beyond the University of Chicago. I've worked on Capitol Hill. Okay, I can do that. I know nothing about it, but I can do that. I went to IBM and ran their government's programs. I said, well, I don't know anything about IBM, but I can do that. The same thing at the State Department, the Pentagon, and the think tank world. Uh, the, the rigor of thinking here, the clarity of thought and analysis stays with you forever. And it is an asset that many, that very few people have. And when you think about that in terms of looking ahead, you have to be very confident of what you have in those capabilities. So, on to the next question. Uh, well, let's see. Do you always want to go into this field? I think we touched on that. Uh, or let's, uh, well, let's think about that, uh, along with uh, given the broad nature of the fields of public policy, NGOs, international relations, uh, when and how were you able to find your specific interests within these fields? Um, and how has your past experience helped you to get to where you are today? Well, you want to start with Fred on that one. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I can Well, you've taken, the, you've taken the brunt of it, maybe the other end of the table. Well, that's right, Rob, it's up to you. Well, in some ways, you know, we've, we've, we've already uh, yeah. touched on it. Um, you know, I, I do, th one of the things, uh, I'm struggling a little bit to see how to form this. I, I suppose the, I'm here, I guess, along with, with others talk about the the think tank part of the world and and what these kind of careers offer to you and sort of how you link it back to school. And I think um, one of the things I would stress, and I'm kind of preempting a little bit the future questions, but I'll tie it in <laughs> a little bit, which is uh, uh, these are great institutions for first jobs. Um, because they also, like your time in Chicago, are going to broaden your experience. They're going to give you opportunities to do other things. We hire a lot of people, for example, at the council and at some of the other places I've worked at the Federal Reserve Board. And we've hired people to come in as research associates, for example. And in some states, we're asking them to continue to be students. We try, there's a certain amount of scut work you do in these kind of jobs, but we also try and give you the opportunity to do analysis, to explore, to stretch yourself in ways that you haven't. Uh, been exposed to. And those make them great to your jobs, not something you want to do necessarily the rest of your life. But uh, we have people who come uh, to, you know, that stay a couple years and then go off in a direction they never imagined. And that's great and that's successful and hopefully the time there help a lot. And just to echo what I said before, I think um, uh, not only is, I would say, being here teaches you the skills to really thrive in those type of jobs, but it is a real accreditation. I do a fair amount of hiring for our institution and uh, a Chicago degree definitely catches people's attention and gets you the opportunity uh, to have that interview and to make your case for it. Um, so I do think you know it is a natural for many people who are interested in the public policy field as a first opportunity, uh, and it will be a, probably a natural uh, a natural fit with the, the experience you've had so far. Um, because, like Rob, my experience at at the university and the college involved, you know, taking every class that happened to strike my fancy. Um, I came out of the college a generalist, and although uh, law school intends to sharpen your mind by narrowing it, <laughs> it uh, failed to do that for me. And so I've remained a generalist, and, and what that means is that this question for me is a little strange. You know, how did I find my current path? Well, my current path is the width of the interstate highway system. <laughs> You know, I, I work in a wide range of substantive fields because I'm a process person. I go into nonprofit agencies and say, okay, how are you doing what you do? Why do you do what you do? Are you succeeding at doing what you do? How do you know? And those are questions that are the same whether I'm talking to an agency that deals with victims of domestic violence or an agency that serves immigrants and refugees or an agency like Greenpeace that is determined to change policy by putting bodies on the line. And that, there are disadvantages to being a generalist 
to that great extent. When I decided I wanted to do more policy work, people wanted to know, well, what's your field? And it's like, well, my field is the world. And I've had to narrow it a little and start focusing on, on court administration and criminal justice so that I could, could play in that particular narrow environment. But I value the ability to jump from one environment to another. Um, echoing also Rob's point about post-college opportunities, I was on the founding board of the University of Chicago Public Interest Program, and probably many of you know that uh, the program places uh, recent graduates with nonprofit agencies here and in Washington. Uh, we keep intending to expand even further um, for one-year fellowships that are you know, based on skills, whether those are in, in computers or in, you know, data crunching or what have you, and gives you some exposure to some of the many, many opportunities there are in public service. And uh, that's the best thing I've done since I got out of the college, because it's an opportunity I wish I had had as an undergraduate. Perhaps if I had had it, I wouldn't have had to go to law school. <laughs> um. So the Peace Corps is kind of a quirky federal agency. Uh, when, when John F. Kennedy and, and Sergeant Shriver started it, um, the idea was that it wasn't going to be this staid bureaucratic agency where people could stay for years, and so they limited the amount of time you could work there, um, which leads to short institutional memory, but it also means that people are consistently coming in and out. Um, so when I was done at Peace Corps, I, I had spent six years there, and I, I knew I had to find something else. I was at the end of my tour, as they say. I couldn't keep going there forever, right? Um, and I surveyed a lot of different areas and fields trying to figure out, like, what is, what is the next thing I want to work on? Um, and the reality is for my entire career, social justice has been the focal point and the key thing, right? And what I saw consistently, whether I was working in drug rehab in Chicago at a youth drop-in center or in community organizing on a little island in the South Pacific, was that education was the driving force of inequity. And, and the reality was that zip codes still determined the quality of an education in our country. And for me, that was not an acceptable state of affairs. Um, and so Teach for America was an opportunity to do something about it. That. Um, I have a five and an eight year old. I live on the west side of Chicago. They are CPS students. Mm -hmm. And I would like to have a system that gives an amazingly quality education to every single kid that walks into a classroom, right? Um, so I, for me, I think that was the trajectory is that to, to me, each and every step was always about justice and it was always about equity. This was just the next opportunity to be able to do something about that um, mm -hmm. and to be able to play a role in it. Well, uh, for me, there are a number of different ways to answer the question. Uh, I won't answer it directly, though. Um, l um, let, me, let me actually go back to a part of the previous set of questions, which was you know, um, you know, the best part of the, my college experience. Um, I, looking back, I actually think one of the best things I did was to volunteer at the Mandel Legal Clinic. Yes, crossing the midway. Oh, my God. Going to the law school. Um, you know, this this was you know during my third year, and I was exploring my career options and thinking, well, okay, well, you know, if I if I want to look at law school, why don't I start volunteering at the you know the clinic arm of the law school? Um, and you know, fortunately, the director of the clinic at the time you know took me on as a as a volunteer for you know two or three afternoons a week. Um, that ended up turning into a work-study job, um, which was nice. Um, but it also gave me some nice exposure to the possibilities of what can be done with the law. Um, you know, whether it's mental health or you know, employment discrimination or, you know, or what have you. And you know, I think that's, that exposure um, you know, helped set me on the path uh, that I ended up on, uh, though you know, in a very specific uh, direction. Um, so, you know, I guess to follow up on, on Rob's comment, um, you, know, I, you, know, you know, if there is a certain area of interest that you have, um, you know, with respect to public policy or law or, you know, um, you know, or, or work in the not-for-profit world, um, one of the best things you can do is um, find an organization or find a community that's, um, you know, that's, uh, that works for you um, and start working there. Make yourself available, um, you know, whether it's weekends or, you know, certain afternoons or mornings uh, during the week or, or finding internship positions. Um, just get yourself out there, get the exposure, get the experience, and, uh, and, and get your name out there. 
Um, you know, and that's, you know, you know, that will enable you to, you know, refine your, refine your direction and, uh, and hopefully guide you, guide you in the future. Can I just jump back in on this for yep, a sure, second? I'm sorry to recontract, sure. but as our speaker did, I'll circle around the <laughs> topics of it. The, um, the, uh, I mean, we're all sort of touching on this theme, you know, that all of us, it sounds like, are doing something very different now than we thought we were going to do coming out of college. We're doing something very different than we probably thought we were doing five or ten years ago. And that's great. That's a positive, right? Mm -hmm. And someone else coined the phrase earlier today, embracing chance. And I really like that because it, it's sort of the positive element of all of this that things will surprise you in unexpected directions. You're building a skill set that allows you to take advantage of it. And it sounds like we also all have stories where, where that happened to us. My, my particular one, which was real serendipity, I was at the IMF uh, in one of my early jobs, and I was working on, uh, literally there was a crisis in which the building was empty. It was right around the holidays. And I was like the only guy in the building. And so they literally came to me and said, we'd like you. In this case, it was to work on Korea. Uh, in the fall, in December of 1997, when they were in the midst of their economic crisis, not because I had, they, they trusted me, they felt I had the skill set, and as I said, I was about the only one left in the building that day. So I ended up spending three months in Korea working with them on, on a debt restructuring plan. And a lot of the work I did later came because of the experience I had and, 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 talk, and the, the stories that came out of that. Uh, I didn't know a day before it was going to happen, but I do feel I was very well trained to take advantage of that opportunity when it arose. And I, I think I want to build on that as well. Um, I guess I've always been interested uh, in international relations, and in part it was because of our, my family uh, from Poland. Uh, a lot of what happened in the Second World War affected a lot of our family. And so that was always part of my growing up, sending care packages to Europe or to, to Ukraine, Soviet Union, Ukraine, etc. So I'd always been interested in international relations, uh, but my focus changed uh, about 180 degrees uh, from the, uh, the far east of Europe to the far east of Asia uh, here at the University of Chicago. Um, actually, I was trying to figure out how do I get out of graduate school. I had been studying Europe for about four years, and it was getting kind of boring, and so I decided, well, okay, enough's enough, uh, but I felt that I also owed my dissertation advisor at that time a, uh, an explanation. And so I tried to think it through. How do I get out of here? And um, so one night it hit me as I was tending bar at Jimmy's was that I've got the answer. I'm going to go in and tell the boss. Well, you know, boss, I'm becoming more and more interested in Asia, but I don't know an Asian language, and therefore I can't do a Chicago-like dissertation on Asia. I said, wow, I was really persuaded of my own logic. And uh, so I called him up and I went to see him. And uh, he is a professor of Japanese ancestry, Akira Irie, a very famous diplomatic historian uh, who wound up at Harvard. And so I told him the story and I said, and so boss, I'm out of here, right? And he looked at me and he said, well, are you trying to tell me that you want to study an Asian language? And I never gamed it down that path. I just absolutely never gamed it down that path. And I said, well, you know, classics major, Latin, Greek, grew up speaking Polish, languages interest me. I said, yeah, you know, they write funny, but it can't be all that difficult, right? So the next thing I knew, he picked up the phone, called Ernest May at Harvard, and said, do you have any extra money in this Ford Foundation language study program? And he said, yeah, and he said, we give it to this guy. And so, I mean, <laughs> I had no idea that I was going to become spent 30 years of my life working on the Asia Pacific region. Um, but that was a life-changing uh, experience that I think could only happen here at the University of Chicago. Um, next question. Uh, have you en en encountered any significant challenges, barriers, or failures during your career? And how were you able to <laughs> overcome them? Uh, and, Anyone who hasn't yeah. isn't doing it. Well, let's, let's, let's yeah. talk about that. Yes, that I can. I can start with, I'll start with this one. I think uh, the most significant challenges for me, uh, having worked in Washington, D.C., having worked uh, in the political realm, was getting fired. I've been fired indiscriminately by Republicans and Democrats alike. So, you know, it's... <laughs> and so it's, you know, that's a real challenge. You wake up the next day and say, wow, what am I going to do? Where's the paycheck? 
uh, and so you have to deal and respond with that. So that was, I think those are the major challenges uh, that I faced. And, uh, and I, again, I think that being prepared to adjust, to adapt, to have the skills that came out of the university, that you brought with, bring with you out of the university, it works. Fred? <laughs> um. Well, um, you know, I, I have also <laughs> lost jobs before. Um, you know, uh, actually, you know, one of one of my major turning points was five years five years out of law school, deciding that uh, I didn't want to practice law anymore. Uh, I was at a legal service uh, outfit um, outside of Chicago, and I had reached a point where. I'd had enough. Um, you know, the, the you know I was seeing too many of the same problems over and over again, um, and in some cases seeing many of the same clients over over and over again with the same problems, and you know nothing was getting done to change their lives or their base or the underlying conditions. So, um, and unfortunately, the the opportunities for making more systemic change were not arising in my current job. So I left. Uh, and you know, ended up doing a f doing a few other things before um, getting engaged in immigration policy. Um, you know, I, I should I should note um, again. You know, I've spent my entire career in the not for profit world, and funding in the not for profit world can be pretty precarious. I have I have also been laid off from a job um, that I really liked uh, because the money ran out to pay for my position. Um, so um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I think I, I may have reached the point where I'm senior enough that uh, you know any organization that would have me would uh, really value me and you know keep me on as a priority. But it also means that uh, that uh, you know folks who go and go into this work have to have some level of entrepreneurial spirit um, in being able to convince. Um, the powers that be that hold the purse strings, whether it's government funders or foundations or private donors, um, that um, that you know that they should devote resources, um, grant funding, uh, contributions to the work that you're doing, and um, and then you know keep on doing that um, so that you, so that you you can keep on doing this work. Yeah, the biggest challenge. I had was probably at 22 out of out of college, uh, going and being a full-time volunteer residential intern at a drug rehab program. Mm. I mean, that was I was not qualified to do that. <laughs> oh. uh, I got room and board, medical insurance, 20 bucks a week, and a bus card to to live at a small little program that was starting on the north side of Chicago to work with recovering addicts and prostitutes. Um, and most of those guys were in their 40s and 50s, and I had no business as a quote-unquote expert not having the experience, but the guy who was running the program was a, a recovering crack addict who had 10 years clean. Mm. And uh, he sat me down at the very beginning of it, and he said, we need you here. Mm. Um, and I know you don't have the ability to connect with these guys based on experience, but mm. you have a personal story, you have a personal journey, you have skills, you have things you can tap into, you can do this. Uh, it was a hard two years, um, but I learned a lot by taking a challenge that I had no business taking, right? Mm. By saying yes to someone that gave you the opportunity to be able to try something and, and do your best to be able to make a difference. So that's, that's the first challenge that popped into my mind. The other one that I would call out is the ability to externalize failure is just critical. Um, and I think we can all say that we believe that, that we learn by failing and say that we're okay making mistakes, but actually believing it in the midst of that failure or in the midst of the thing that you didn't do well is a lot harder than believing it in an ideological sense. Like, I absolutely believe that we learn by trying and we learn by making mistakes, and yet when you're in the midst of the moment where you've made a mistake and it's impacted your work or it's impacted the team you manage, um, where you feel like you've failed, it's difficult to say, okay, I'm going to step back and learn from the experience I just had, from the thing that just didn't go right, from the thing I could have done better, from the thing that makes me feel disappointed in myself and this year at work, right? I'm going to be able to distance myself enough from it to learn from it, build on it, and move forward is a hard skill. Um, and I think everything you can do to be able to learn that consistently and to be okay with failing occasionally is really critical. Kelly? Um, I'm not sure whether I externalized failure or internalized it so much that it determined the next, you know, 35 years of my life. Um, <clears throat> I took a job that I had no business taking. 
uh, I became the executive director of the Chicago Children's Choir. And the reason I had no business taking this job was first that I had never uh, run an agency before. I was the dean of admissions of a law school uh, that was part of a university. So for example, uh, when paychecks had to come out, they came out from somewhere else. You know, They just sort of appeared. And then I went to this small agency where if paychecks were coming out, it was because I was signing the paychecks and walking to the bank and putting the withholding money in and so on. Anyway, uh, I also had no business taking the job because I don't like either children or choral music. <laughs> <laughs> and what I thought to myself was, oh, it's the nonprofit community and I want to be a college president and I'm going to learn how to raise money and people who run small nonprofits never do anything but raise money and so I'm going to learn and it's like, okay. There's no connection between what a college president does and what the executive director of a small nonprofit does. None. Zero. Zip. So I was begging for pencils. And um, anyway, I did a really, really terrible job. And the agency was in really, really terrible shape when I got there. And anything that didn't go wrong spontaneously, I screwed up myself. And it was the longest nine months of my life, and it cost me, you know, my self-respect and my marriage and, you know, long list of things. But when I got done, I said, aha, I know what I'm going to do now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go from one nonprofit agency to another saying, oh, my God, don't do that. I did that. That was a bad thing to do. <laughs> do this instead. And for 30 years, that's what I've done. Um, obviously, I didn't know everything there was to know about managing nonprofits, but I knew enough from my experience, and I certainly had enough empathy for anybody who was having a hard time running a nonprofit, that I was able to walk into institutions that did work whose substance I didn't know very much about, but whose process I knew an enormous amount about. And so, I have to be grateful for that failure, and it was the most horrible time of my life. I just, <laughs> there's, there isn't any way to make it something other than that. Uh, I hope that not all of you will, you know, feel compelled to have a catastrophic failure on your way to figuring out what you'd like to do or what you're good at doing. But if you do, I promise it will work out if you can just like smoke enough dope until everything is okay <laughs> and not kill yourself. <laughs> a bit of a 70s reference. I mean, well, so, well, that Rob, would be a 70s reference yeah. except for the fact that marijuana is going to be legal. legal right. So it's like it loses some of the, uh, the value as a... No, I, I, in some ways, I think you have an advantage we didn't have in that there's more examples out there of entrepreneurs uh, and this sort of idea of failing before success, mm -hmm. which we didn't have so much. I mean, I was on a panel recently with some entrepreneurs, and I can tell you I was not the reason why the room was filled, but the reason the room was filled was because they wanted to hear these people who had ha who documented 5, 10, 15 failures before they came up with an extraordinary app that allowed you to take photos and and put them, uh, and share them in various ways. And indeed, the guy who was um, uh, the, the star of the show then outlaid, he said, you know, I have this company, and it's making money, but that's great, but I've got four other new ideas, and it, I'm hoping only three of them are failures. And this guy was, real, you know, was someone people wanted to model after. So in some ways, I think listen, watching that is good. One other comment, it's a bit of a, it may seem completely disjoint, but it, it is something I think about in this context a bit. So my first job out of school was working for the government. I knew pretty much what success was. It was making my boss look good, doing good analysis that informed the policy debate. And very, but very regimented. I knew exactly, I was part of a team, I knew what the deadlines were, and, and how to have an, a positive effect. Uh, I, I was challenged at the International Monetary Fund because you would go off and try to help countries in crisis, and sometimes <coughs> it wouldn't help. And you'd have to stop and say, did, I, did we give the right advice? Was it something we could have done better? But this is my first job in, public, in this sort of NGO think tank world. And one of the things that strikes me is, is the whole question of what defines success in my world now. I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but I know that that's what I have to work on and think about. In other words, you know, okay, 
I'm sitting here now, I have, I have issues I work on, what is going to make me successful or not? Is it some generalized sense of informing the public debate, making public policy better? Those are really good things if they can happen. How do you do that? It's sort of up to me. I don't come in in the morning and have a meeting at 10, 11, and 12. I come in the morning and think, well, how am I going to run my day? How am I going to manage it to try and drive the debate? Um, and so in that sense, it puts a lot more on me, but also it's a little more amorphous about what will be successful. If you're working on the Hill uh, for Congress, it may be moving a piece of legislation, but frankly, as you know, these days, very little legislation gets moved. And so you have to think, how can I make a positive impact to th these things? I think these are important, challenging questions, but I think we're in a space here now where sometimes they can be pretty hard to really figure out what that is. Let's, let's try to move quickly through these next series of questions uh, briefly. What are the best ways to, uh, for people to approach the field that you're in? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you suggest going about gaining appropriate experiences? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how do you think about differentiating yourself as a candidate for potential jobs and internships? Mm -hmm. Fred? Yeah, I, I guess I've already spoken to that yeah. point, yeah. which is, yeah, uh, yeah um, you know, doing your research, uh, you know, um, Finding finding an issue that you're particularly interested in or passionate about, um, you know, finding other people or organizations that uh, that are doing this work, um, and uh, you know, making yourself available. Um, again, whether it's a volunteer as a volunteer or an intern or an extern, um, and you know, again, gaining that experience, gaining that knowledge, building those connections and those networks, um, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, positioning yourself um, for you know. The next, uh, the next step in your in your path. Cool. This is going to be a huge surprise, but I think the Peace Corps and Teach for America are both great things to consider when you go to <laughs> college. Um, no. So there is that option. Uh, I, right. I I do think I you know my background uh, a little bit was in theater in college, um, and since then on and off. And when you get when you hang out with actors and directors, one of the things they will often mm. say is always say yes. That's their advice. Right. Always say yes. Like you get the opportunity to do something always say yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think there's something to that. Like if you're really passionate about being involved in a sector, it might not be the perfect opportunity for you to be able to jump at the first time. It might not look exactly like the thing you want to do, but it's an opportunity for you to be able to work in the arena that you're passionate about, in the arena you want to learn about, in the arena where you want to challenge yourself, right? Say yes to that. Um, I, I really do think that's a part of it. And, you know, in my personal experience, I do think that, like, Peace Corps was a huge part of that. I, I think um, there are plenty of folks who have opportunities to be able to tackle something for a couple years. And, yes, it's a short-term opportunity, but during that short-term opportunity, what are you going to learn and how are you going to develop? And what are those challenges going to do for you to be able to springboard you into whatever it is that comes next? Well, I just want to build on that for a moment because I think that's very important when you think about positions, as you were saying, it may be a short-term opportunity. Mm -hmm. To think about it as one gaining experience, mm -hmm. but two having someone else pay you to find the next job that you're really interested in. It may not right. be a perfect start, but it is a start. You're getting paid, and you're, give, you're given the opportunity to further refine what it is you're thinking about. Yeah, mm -hmm. Kelly. Well, I've already answered this as well because I think the U of C Public Interest Program is <laughs> is a great way to get into this. I just also want to mention that this is not a process that's going to end for you guys this year or next yep. year or five years from now. I am 40 years out of college and have done a lot of good stuff. And right now, to get into a policy space that I want to get into, I'm doing pro bono work. And I'm doing it to make the connections. I mean, all the stuff that we're saying to you is going to go on being true. I'd love to say, oh no, you will never, ever have to do that again. But if you have a wide range of interests, as most of us do, and you say to yourself after five years doing X that you'd really rather do Y, they're mostly the way to get into Y is to kind of attach yourself to somebody who's doing Y mm -hmm. who may or may not be willing to pay you for it. Mm -hmm. And that's just, yeah. you know, like life in the bigs. Yeah, I think the unpaid, the unpaid internship is kind of a new animal now, and um, I'm embracing it because I love getting work from people without having to pay them for it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, big fan You're of You're my explorer. Yes, I am. I am, absolutely. Um, but, 
And I, I'm going to give you a two-handed answer on the internship issue because I do see, while I do see some cases where an internship where you really just get in the door and you're helping out and you're doing whatever has to be done and you're getting a great exposure to the industry and learning what it's like to go to work and these kind of environments and deal with that can be pretty useful. In a, in a CFR type of environment, I actually would counsel the other way. If you're looking for the internship, look for something which is going to have a product associated, like a published mm -hmm. document. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, or, you know, something that's going to be produced that you kind of have your name associated with. And there's two reasons for it. One is, if something comes out and it's published and you're associated with it, that really actually looks pretty good for the next round, the next step when you're applying for jobs. I also think, frankly, you know, uh, sometimes people are pretty busy and they want to manage you more than they do. But if you're with a project that has a deadline that has an institutional importance rather than something that's maybe additional, then they're going to focus on you, they're going to give it the time and attention, and they're going to give you the time and attention that probably makes it a more worthwhile thing. So that would, I tend to come out on that side on that. As I mentioned earlier, these two-year, in Washington in particular is what I know, these two-year research associate positions I think are a wonderful starting job. It doesn't mean you have to go on in that field. A lot of people say, I've had a great time, now I'm going to use it as a springboard elsewhere. But you can do it that way, and you're surrounded by a lot of people like yourself. You're learning a lot, and it's a great, it's a great starting job. Um, you will live in a small apartment uh, that you're paying most of your salary for rent for, but it will be worth it. <laughs> yeah. um, I think um, we've got a couple of more questions here, like describe your typical day, uh, your recommendations, et cetera. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure that those will be answered in terms of responding to your questions, and I really want to engage the audience here and the students here, because that's the reason we are here, is to take sure. your questions and try and answer them. So let me turn it over to the floor and the questions. Um, I think it's a great question. I mean, the reality is I haven't worked in the private sector at all, right? Like in the, in the duration of my experience, I've even be, either been a public employee or a nonprofit employee. Um, but I, my, my wife, conveniently enough, works at a place called the Center on Values Driven Leadership, which is a PhD program and think tank for CEOs and executives that are, that are really wanting to lead with values in mind and, and make for a better society. So I do think there are opportunities out there for, the, for that kind of thing. And I think, there are, I think they're more common now than they were even 10 years ago, right? Um, organizations that are explicitly saying this is part of the primary thing that we do. Um, at the same time, though, I don't know that I'm an expert as a primarily nonprofit employee to talk about what it could look like. There's a real tension on this question in my, uh, over on the economic side uh, because uh, you know, I, I, I got, you know, went to the Fed because I wanted to do public policy. I got involved in all this developing country debt and stuff. I loved it. I thought I'm you know, making a difference and so on. So I think it was a public policy drive for me. But at some point decided I wanted some diverse experience, ended up taking a private sector job. Uh, to be also very candid, it was a midlife crisis. I wanted to m go abroad, and it paid for, allowed us to live in London for years, which was really cool. Um, so I'm really glad I did it. But you know, I am. In, but still, to the extent that public policy positions are still sort of what I, you know, I kind of still have inside me the desire to do. I, I am intrigued by this debate. You'll see it with Helen Warren and some of the other commentary on the Hill, where she's been very critical of people who've been nominated for high-level positions mm -hmm. who have primarily financial sector experience. So I have to be honest with you, there's still that tension there. Mm -hmm. There's still this idea, while there's sort of acceptance in the broad level of an idea that moving back and forth between public and private can give you a breadth of skill that can actually make you better at doing public policy in the mm -hmm. future, and I absolutely agree, think it is true in finance and in international financial issues. I think I am better for having had some time on the other side of the table. I think there is no doubt questions about the revolving door, questions about uh, whether that is a tarring experience to have been, say, bailed out by TARP during the financial crisis and the like, and I think they're legitimate questions. So I think my, in my side of the industry is still very much grappling with that. My bottom line, though, I think done well, it's, it, it absolutely can be a plus to, move, to do that. Uh, to, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just, you know, Individual corporations will advance public policy goals within their micro environment, and that also contributes larger to the larger public good as well. And I think about IBM. IBM was a very progressive uh, organization when I was there, and I think it has always been that's the case. The CEO now is, is a woman, uh, and I think that you know testifies to the openness of the corporation and the way it has positioned itself, and I think that reflects broader social public policy objectives. I would, I, I approach this from a slightly 
different perspective in, within the nonprofit community and you know, within people who are primarily focused on social justice, there's a lot of debate about the proper role of the for-profit sector and social entrepreneurship. I mean, I'm sure all of this is stuff, uh, there are buzz phrases that you've heard. I'm, um, it would be polite to say I was agnostic about social entrepreneurship, but I think I'm actually kind of an out-and-out -out skeptic about social entrepreneurship. I think it's very difficult for for-profit agencies to solve social problems without in some way diminishing the, um, the amount of resources that are put into those social problems. You know, if you have to skim off profit from the top, then that's X fewer people that you serve. On the other hand, if it's a way to get people who otherwise wouldn't give anything to the social justice sector to stick their hands in their pockets, then, then that can be useful. I think recently um, greater claims have been made for social entrepreneurship, uh, double bottom line institutions, uh, social impact bonds, then can actually be justified by the evidence. But I think it's, it's a conversation and a, a set of experiments that will go on. And if it's something in which you're interested, um, looking for a company, that, you know, Ben and Jerry's or whomever, that says, we're in the business of doing social justice and this is how we do it and also make a profit, you can evaluate whether you think that what they're saying is accurate. I think you can actually, I think it's easier now than maybe it was 20, I think 20 years ago it was really just the Ben and Jerry's of this world where it really had an explicit social mandate as part of, the, I, I think hopefully it's easier now to make the case that a profit maximizing firm no, I don't think so. can monetize a brand that includes mm. social justice. And mm. I think that's mm. perfectly legitimate. Yeah. I don't think of it as a skimming. It's, you, you gotta be able to, if you're working in those institutions, convince them that to be associated with these projects, to drive them, not only make things possible that wouldn't be possible, uh, but will ultimately create support for the company and a, bit, and yeah. a, and a, a yeah. brand for it. I, I think that can be done. I, th I think we can still do better in that regard, but certainly, uh, there's a lot of good to be done. You mentioned the social bonds. This is like you know raising money for vaccines, right, or something like that. Uh, it is tough to do, but I will point out that it's a number, a bunch of ex-bankers who had a social welfare kind of vision going off into that sector and trying to create in a way that's now making these some of these things possible in ways that um, that weren't before. So I think there's there's oh. space for you guys to do a lot of good. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's it, that's absolutely true, and the 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 tension within the nonprofit sector, um, to some extent, is about what's really the most effective way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some reason to think, for example, that the, the notion of social entrepreneurship is more focused on the concerns of for-profit corporations that if they don't mm -hmm. announce that they're social entrepreneurs, they will be held liable by their stockholders for not maximizing mm -hmm. stockholder value. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's evolving, and yeah. you're absolutely right. It isn't just Ben and Jerry's. It's many, many companies, and some of them regard their their social impact as being, you know, the kind of work they do. We create solar panels, or whatever it might be. So I think there are options there. Um, they're they're not as uh, simple as going into the nonprofit sector. Right. On the other hand, they probably pay better. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to address this question from the other end of the telescope and you know, focus uh, hyper-specifically in one area, which is immigration, and specifically immigration law. Um, um, we, you know, I, I work very closely with a number of attorneys in private practice. They work for for-profit firms. Many of them are solo practitioners or, you know, or run, run small for-profit firms. And, you know, but you know, even though they are for-profit operations, um, they have a, a very strong social justice focus. They're, they are not 
you know, they're not getting into immigration law for the money. Um, they they get into immigration law because they, you know, they they don't like seeing people being persecuted in their home countries, or they don't like seeing people, be, you know, families being separated, or uh, families facing deportation. So, or you know, or you know, they they may have some experience in their own family history, um, either their parents or their spouses or other loved ones um, are are. Um, you know, have faced these kinds of issues. Um, so, you know, I, I think, that, you know, in the immigration bar specifically, you will see that a very strong overlap between, um, you know, a, you know, a, you know, a, a commitment to, you know, social justice issues, but, you know, w you know, through a, through a uh, for-profit operations. Yeah. yeah. Please. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> let me let me jump into that question. Uh, I actually think it was a mistake for me to go directly into law school right out of college, and I ended up taking a year off of law school um, to basically make up for that. I just wasn't ready for law school. Um, and you know so and it's becoming increasingly common for people to, you know, graduate from college, take a few years off, explore their options, and then go to graduate school or law school or professional school. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I kind of wish I'd done that myself. Um, having said that, if you are ready to go into a graduate program right out of college, more power to you. Go for it. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, if, you know, you have to think of, think also about, you know, you know, going into the job market or you know finding other support if you do not go into go go into a graduate program right out of college. Um, you know, a lot of people work. I I worked during my my year off of law school. I found a a, a nonprofit organization. You know, back you know back in the city where my parents where my parents are and uh, work there and actually had really wonderful experiences there that you know, refueled my interest in, in going back to law school and, and, uh, and pursuing, pursuing the law and policy as a career. Anyone else? I was really grateful that I did a couple years before I did graduate school, and I think part of the reason for that is, I mean, if I don't know what I want to be now, you can imagine how little I know at <laughs> 22, right? I, I do think, like, I do think you, you, you have the advantage, first of all, of bringing back to the academic context mm -hmm. practical real world realities yeah. that you can check a theory against, right? Like, right. huh, that's not how it played out in the nonprofit where I worked right. at, or that's not how it played out in my direct practitioner experience. And I, I do think that's really valuable. And I also think that sometimes you learn about yourself or an arena that you're passionate about that you just didn't anticipate you were. Um, and I think giving yourself the opportunity to have that kind of a curveball before you start Mm -hmm. um, quite frankly, digging yourself in, under a load of debt um, can be a really mm -hmm. good thing. So I, I'm definitely grateful for it. I don't think it's the only way to do it. I knew people in my graduate school experience who were doing it right out of, of college and were really grateful for that. But for me, I was grateful to have the opportunity. I also just think from, a, um, from that, that equity perspective, like I think it's a great opportunity right out of college when you have no mortgage and like nothing like holding you down to be able to go and invest and give back in a, a whole wide range of arenas. Um, and that's a unique window to be able to do that. Uh, as somebody who served in Peace Corps a little bit later in my 20s, the most common groups that were there were people who were right out of college mm -hmm. and people who had just retired. Because those are windows yeah. when you're like, hey, guess what? I'm not tied down. I can do this. And there aren't a lot of moments in life like that. So I think take advantage of it when you can. I'll just speak for myself. And that is, yeah, I went directly in from a BA, to a master's degree. I was pretty confident this is what I wanted to do. I was interested in international relations and I wanted, wanted to advance my understanding and theory of international relations. That said, it was definitely time for a break after that master's degree. There was no doubt about that. Uh, and um, I'm certainly glad that I did. Yep. Yeah. No, I also went straight in afterwards. Um, there's no right answer. Uh, I too probably would have done taken a break. Uh, I, I had an interesting experience with my former research associate who took the break, decided then she wanted to go to graduate school in economics and 
was passionate about that. I worried about her sanity, but decided to support <laughs> her. Um, but she, she didn't have the math she felt she needed. There's a lot more math in economic grad school now than there was when I was there. And so we paid for her to, to get some math on the side. I don't know that it made her weekends fun, but I mean, it was also a good example. I mean, to the extent you worry that these kind of jobs, these kind of experiences can take you away from the, acad the academic intensity that you need in a graduate program, it doesn't have to be that way. And I think that I don't want to take any credit, too much credit for it, but I do think both the job, but coupled with the fact that she showed the, in, the dedication of taking the additional courses to help prepare, actually uh, helped her get into the program she wanted to get into. So it doesn't have to be a trade-off in that sense. Other questions? Come on. What I mean, I'm getting, a, I'm getting away from, the pulp, from my current job. I would certainly say in kind of the, the finance, private sector side, you're looking for a mix of skills. I mean, I had a team when I was at, at, there was a bank I was with where I had a team that had a physicist, a mathematician, you know, an econometrician, kind of, a journalist, right? And there were the mix of skills. We weren't, none of them had MBAs. So, I mean, I, I do think that, generally speaking, econometric or empirical skills are very valuable in this job market, right? Mm -hmm. And that can be everything from knowing programs that are relevant for the particular area you're working in, to just basically having good n empirical skills, I think really can play very well in a wide range of fields. Um, you know, so I, certainly we look for that as a positive when we're looking at people. But I don't think if, you know, if, you're, if you have a math background or a physics background, you can go in a lot of different directions and really sell that as being a, a really the kind of skill mix that adds something to a team. Mm -hmm. Looking at my current organization, right, I, I manage an operations team that helps facilitate about 1,500 hires annually. That's people who are training teachers, people who are recruiting teachers, people who are coaching and mentoring teachers. Um, I need project managers to get that done. I need an applicant tracking system that functionally tracks everybody and collects all the information they're submitting and allows everybody to review it in a timely and efficient fashion. Um, I need probably some kind of, of tracker of all the different constituents we're working with as we try to recruit those people and find them and where are they and where are they coming from, right? Um, there are people who are working just in the IT realm in our organization. There are people who are mm -hmm. working in more more of a research focused area of what does it look like for us to teach STEM effectively, mm -hmm. right, nationwide. So you've got, yeah. th that's a wide variety of things just in a one relatively small organization. I mean, you know, we're talking about a place that has two or 3,000 staff, like in comparison to IBM, it's certainly small. In comparison mm -hmm. to the other places where I've worked, it's pretty big. Um, but I think that gives you a, a sense of the fact that that's a wide variety of skills that are needed. Um, mm -hmm. And I want somebody who's got some of those hard operational skills to be able to be a partner and get our work done. Because sometimes, as a manager, I might not be the one who has it, right? Um, and so I really need those people to be working at our organization and being involved. Yeah. Um, for, for my organization, I can think of you know, two specific areas. One, Cliff already mentioned IT, you know, database management, uh, um, website management, social media, you know, all, you know, you know, the entire, you know, you know, the, you know, the, the entire, you know, internet presence, uh, you know, as well as, as well as just, you know, um, you know, um, you know, maintaining our maintaining our computer networks and all and all of that. Um, um, that's and a lot of nonprofit organizations um, would like to have better infrastructure in that in that respect, but can't afford it. Um, so, um, to the extent that uh, that uh, you know that you know you your colleagues may be willing to you know just even help out uh, a lot of these smaller not-for-profits that have limited budgets and being able to develop their infrastructure in that respect that would that's wonderful um, another specific area and I'm thinking I'm thinking in terms of one of my one of my former colleagues who is just a math whiz is uh, you know there is a, a certain need uh, in public policy uh, for just plain old plain old number crunching whether it's demographic research or or, um, reviewing electoral data, uh, which is something that we do quite a bit, um, you know, you know, requires some fairly sophisticated math, math and computer skills. So, um, you know, there's definitely a need for that as well. Yeah, I, I think that 
um, those skills, uh, looking at it in a think tank role, I'm thinking of one individual in particular who has the skills, the, the data skills, the mathematical skills. Mm -hmm. But he's able to combine that with a real understanding of policy mm -hmm. and to integrate the numbers and to yeah. tell you what, is it, what does it exactly mean, what are these, where are these trends taking you, what should you be doing to adjust and adapt in, in, in that particular context. So I think, and, and, and it's certainly true in, in terms of the government, people are looking for not only people who can crunch numbers, but to tell you what those numbers mean and why, and why you should be doing X or as opposed to Y. Right. right, and really never underestimate the mathematical confusion and innumeracy <laughs> oh yeah, of most people who are making public policy. Oh my. They don't know what the studies that they're looking at mean. And I, I just, I can't emphasize it enough. You know, people say, oh, well, we got a 50% return on this. The question of whether a 50% return is a good return or a bad return is one that most of them are not equipped to answer. And, you know, people with essentially basic statistical skills are bonus babies. So if you're an actual mathematician, this may be beneath you, but the... There's, there's not nearly enough understanding on the part of the lay public in general and elected officials in particular of the meaning of the data they're looking at. Yep. And anyone who can help them translate that yep. is a prize. I think that's a really great point. You know, we, uh, so we had a round table a couple weeks ago on big data, mm -hmm. right? And uh, how it's changing. In this case, it was the uh, intelligence world, right? Could, you know, we miss the Arab Spring. So could we have done better if we were monitoring how, what people, how people were using social media, whether they were even canceling reservations to go out because all of a sudden they, weren't, you know, they didn't want to be on the streets, things like that. This is a whole new world for a lot of old industry types like myself who don't get it, don't have the skills necessarily to bring it, but realize there's this tremendous wealth of information. We're trying to kind of bring Moneyball now to, the, to all these other areas. And so people who have the skills to do that can bring a lot of value now to a lot of the public policy yeah. debates. It's a, it's a very wide open area. And I'll just say from a small nonprofit perspective before yeah. I worked where I do now, like the, the reality is it's not enough for us to feel like we're making a difference. We have to know that we're succeeding, right? And, yeah. and the ability to understand <laughs> how to set goals, how to measure those goals, exactly. how to track those goals, and really make the case that, hey, we're actually making a significant measurable impact mm -hmm. on this issue that we said matters to us is really critical. Super important. If yes, you sir. can't quantify it, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. <laughs> That's it. It's always heartbreaking when people do not recognize that you're God and you know everything <laughs> and that therefore they ought to do what you tell them. Um, so my ego took quite a beating as a result of, uh, of the fact that my clients often do not pay any attention to what I tell them to do. I still... My experience of, of consulting with small and medium-sized nonprofits is that I am educating people. And, you know, it's frustrating that I'm educating them, you know, 12 board members at a time, but I'm still doing it about how the nonprofit sector does work, how it should work. And so the outcome that I'm looking for is not only the specific outcome in my strategic planning recommendations, it's the extent to which I have taught people who work in another sector how, how they can contribute to nonprofits, how they can contribute to the, to the policy work that nonprofits do, to the service work that they do, and so on. So I guess that's a, that's a process of, uh, 
an evolution of me personally. But yeah, I mean, if, if I couldn't handle the fact that people ignore what I say, I couldn't be a consultant. <laughs> and this they do pay me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, don't go to law school the way I did. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I don't regret going. It was wonderful in, in many ways, but I clearly remember in the middle of my second year in law school, I was watching the movie The Producers. And uh, Leo Bloom says, I spend my life counting money, other people's money, people I'm smarter than. And I sat down and wrote on a little piece of paper, I think I'm Leo Bloom and I should drop out of law school. <laughs> because before I went there, I didn't know what I was going there to look for. Mm. And I guess that, to the extent that there's an answer to your question, that's it. If you know what you're looking for, you can find it. Um, and you'll know whether you can find it in a graduate program in Russian studies because you want to take the foreign service exam. Uh, if you don't know what you're looking for, if you're just sort of swimming along thinking, hmm, this, this is the future. It's sure interesting out here. Um, you will have a very hard time finding what you're looking for. I did not find what I was looking for in law school. I didn't find what I was looking for in law practice. I was fortunate that I got randomly diverted into academe and then further into the nonprofit sector and went, this is it. And, you know, ultimately that's going to happen to everybody. Really, no kidding. You know, you're going to find your way. But it's a lot cheaper <laughs> to decide, to know that you're looking for something if you're going to pay people. 15,000 or 45,000 or whatever the hell it is a year to go there. I didn't even have to carry debt out of law school and it was still a waste of money. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I had finished my master's, I moved on from the BA to the MA in international relations, decided to take a break, it was time for a break. But looking ahead, I was thinking, well, what about law school? So I spent three days at the University of Chicago Law School, and I said, no, this is not where I'm going, and that was the end of that. And then I took the rest of the year off and moved on in terms of my PhD. So I think it really is important. If you know what you're doing, that, that's the key thing. If you're just kind of floating around, that, that's, a, that's not, a good, it's not a good place to be in in terms of making those kind of decisions. I don't, I don't think it's a matter of... of finding a passion. I think it's a matter of identifying a passion. And, and that's not simple either, but it's already inside you, you know? I mean, I, like Cliff, everything I've done in my life is about social justice. And if I had bothered to sit back and say, oh my God, I've been working on left-wing political campaigns since I was eight years old, <laughs> it would have been clearer to me that everything in my life was about social justice. So, you know, you were not born today or even yesterday. And there are already things activating your life that will tell you mm -hmm. what the next step's gonna look like. And I know that sounds like one of these like Zen retreat <laughs> things, but really, really, you already exist and that, that person, the only obstacle to becoming the person that, that you're already in embryo is saying to yourself, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. You know, I, I did not become a journalist because I said to myself, I couldn't possibly do that. That was just idiotic. I don't know why I thought I couldn't do that. I didn't go into the theater because I thought, you know, I couldn't possibly do that. So if you figure out a way to get the I couldn't possibly do that out of your brain, it will be clear to you what it is that you want to do. And as you said earlier, it's not that you're necessarily going to be perfect at it. Right? No. Maybe no. that you learn from it that is something different. And that's okay, too. You have to be willing to take those risks. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. But do it. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I, um, 
I wouldn't want to leave you with the impression that working at the Chicago Children's Choir ended my marriage. It was, you know, an agonizing experience which turned me into a raving harpy, and that ended my marriage. Um, I, I've actually been incredibly fortunate in not having the constraints that you talk about. I never wanted to have children, and so I never did. Um, I'm financially comfortable and had saved enough from law practice that I could float for a little while while I was trying to, to find my place in the world and could volunteer while I was, you know, trying to find my place. Um, you know, there, there were, and I'm sure this is true of, of everybody, there were a couple of givens. I was never going to leave Chicago. I didn't grow up here. But I came here, I've been in love with it since the minute I got here. And, you know, I was thinking about being a college president. I thought, well, I'm not going to do that if I have to go to, you know, South Dakota. And the truth was, I wasn't going to do that if I had to go anywhere but Chicago. In fact, I was really only interested in being president of the University of Chicago. <laughs> and, you know, as that didn't come along, I had to think of something else. So, I, I'm not sure quite what I've told you. I, I guess... I now experience my life as an integrated thing, that my personal passions and my professional passions have come together. But, you know, I'm going to be 60 in a couple of weeks, and that's how long it's taken me to be that level of integrated. So I'm not really sure I can tell you anything that's at all useful. I, I, think, integrated, I think integrated is a really good word. Yeah. I think we tend to talk about... Um, some of my organization talks about regularly. We tend to talk about work-life balance as though they are, are mutually exclusive things that outweigh each other, right? Um, as opposed to personal professional alignment. And, and I think that's a different way of looking at it. But I, I do think that it's important that you recognize yourself as being a whole human being. Um, mm -hmm. when, my, when my mom passed away unexpectedly two years ago, I got a note um, that said, be generous to yourself. Grief is not linear. Um, and that was so true. And the reality is your career's not linear. Your life's not linear. And it is important to be generous to yourself, to understand what you need to function effectively, not just as a worker, but as a human being, right? Yeah. And, and that's, that's going to mean different things at different seasons. It, it means one thing when you're at one job. It means something else when you're at the next. It means one thing when your kids are, you know, infants. It means something else when they're older. It's, it's going to change and evolve. Allow that to change and evolve, but yeah. never allow yourself to stop asking the question what you need to be at your absolute best and to be doing work that you find meaningful while also living a life you find meaningful. Right? Yeah, I, I think, I, I, you know, you, you, you define those as constraints, and that's one way of looking at that. I would look at more in terms of opportunities, mm -hmm. opportunities for personal growth, mm -hmm. and how do you manage that in terms of building your, your own personality, your own persona, over the years. So it really depends on how you start to define the problem to, to, to get to the answers you're looking for. In my case, I saw them as, as real opportunities. I, I think they're constrained sometimes, but uh, <laughs> I, I, look, I, it, I'll be very candid. So I have, my wife is also is a PhD economic, economist and has a really impressive career. And we probably, I think, especially since the kids came, we've been in like this, it's a constant negotiation. Yeah. And she keeps on reminding me, you can't, you know, it's nonlinear. I like that a lot. Uh, and Rob, you won't be able to do the job you want the most all the time, but you'll be able to do it sometime. And hopefully we're getting the balance right so each of us feels we're kind of having our share of time and that we're balancing it. And uh, yeah, that's a, a center, you know, now the kids are older and there's a little more freedom, but it's still a negotiation and it's still trade-offs. There are jobs I, you know, I wasn't able to do because it wasn't the right time for the family and that was okay too, but I still kept in my heart, I will get my chance at a future date, and it becomes then a, a partnership to try and you know navigate it together. I will say that the one thing that your question resonated with me was this move to London that I did, which was a midlife crisis, totally. Uh, I remember at the time I was absolutely sure there was no way we were ever going to do this. We couldn't possibly move abroad. It was too complicated. The kids were in school, you know. And in some extent, it was a leap of faith. Just move, and we got there, and we did find schools, and no one died. <laughs> and it was, an, it was to this day for our family probably the most formative experience that our kids have had. So I'm really glad I did it. But I remember being very daunted when first considering it. And you have to, as I think you're hearing from all of us, be, be open to those kind of things, but sometimes take that leap. 
running up on time. Uh, I want to thank you all for participating, and I want to leave you with one thought that I completely forgot, my happiest day at the University of Chicago. Now this, this goes back a while. So I'm about three days before my PhD exam, okay, the oral exam. And I was working with then, uh, he had already left the university, he'd come back, Hans Morgenthau. And Hans Morgenthau had a reading list that was 50 pages long, single space, in Greek, Italian, Russian, French, you name it, there was, it was in there. And so about three days before the exam, I walked in and I said, man, there's no way I can go through this. He said, you know, I could spend a lifetime reading this and never understand it even. And so he looked at me in his German and he says, well, he says, you read my books. I said, well, yeah, of course. He says, well, that's all you need to know. Go see a movie. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I did, and he pitched it right down the middle. He just said, well, did you read this book? Yeah, right, boom, it was done. <laughs> so that was my happy stay at the University of Chicago. <laughs> so thank you very much. And any further questions? I'll be outside. We'll be outside. Please. Okay, thank you. Thank you.